Ever wonder how our brains actually build knowledge? We experience like tons of information every day, but how do we connect all the dots? We're gonna take a deep dive into that, exploring these things called non-equivalence relations, whatever those are. Yeah, it's easy to think learning is all about just recognizing what's the same, like uh, matching shapes as a kid or remembering names, that kind of thing. But the really fascinating part is how much of our understanding actually comes from what's different and how those differences relate to each other. Okay, so you've been looking into this chapter on non-equivalence relations from like a behavioral analysis textbook, right? Mm -hmm. What's the main takeaway here? Well, think of it like this. Imagine your brain is kind of like building this giant network, almost like a map, but instead of places, it's concepts and ideas. Non-equivalence relations are like all the roads and highways that are connecting everything. It's how we navigate the world, make decisions, even understand ourselves, you know? Okay, so it's not just about knowing that A is A, but it's more like understanding how A relates to B and C and everything else on that map in our minds. Exactly. The chapter actually uses this really interesting example of the word beer to kind of show this. When you hear that word beer, it might make you think of its opposite, like wine or other examples in that category, like uh, lager or something, or even just like feelings you associate with beer, relaxation or memories like Friday night. Those connections, like all those relationships are what really give the word beer its meaning. That's actually really cool. Yeah. But I will say the chapter uses some... Uh pretty technical terms to describe those relationships. I felt like I was learning a whole new language. Oh, absolutely. And one of the key ones is this idea of mutual entailment, which, yeah, it's a fancy way of just saying that relationships go both ways. Think of it like when you're learning a new word and then at the same time, you're also learning its opposite. So if you learn hot is the opposite of cold, you automatically know that cold is the opposite of hot. You don't have to be explicitly taught both directions. You just kind of get it, you know? So we're like these really efficient learners our brains are picking up on those uh, reciprocal relationships kind of automatically. Exactly. And then it gets even more complex with this idea of combinatorial entailment. This is where our brains start making connections between different things because they share a common link, even if those two things were never directly paired together before. Okay, I'm definitely going to need an example to wrap my head around that one. Okay, so imagine you learn that um, lemon is related to sour, and you also learn that sour is the opposite of sweet. Combinatorial entailment means that your brain might then go on and connect lemon to sweet, even though you've never been specifically taught that those two things go together. So it's almost like our brains are constantly playing this mental connect the dots game using the relationships that we already know to kind of like infer new ones. Yeah, exactly. And that ability to kind of make those connections, to make those inferences is a big part of what allows us to learn new things and then adapt to new situations so quickly. Wow, that's incredible. There was one other term that the chapter kind of kept coming back to, this idea of transformation of function. What is that one all about? This is where it gets really interesting. Transformation of function basically means that the way we react to something, like our actual response to it, can completely change based on its relationship to something else. Think of it like this. Imagine there's this song that you really, really love. But then one day you hear that same song right before you're about to drink, like a whole glass of pickle juice, which you would never want to do, obviously. <laughs> OK, I think I could already feel my stomach churning just thinking about that. Yeah. So what happens then? Does that song like forever become the soundtrack to pickle juice trauma after that? Well, here's the thing. Through that transformation of function, that song that you used to love so much, it might actually start to make you feel kind of queasy even if there's no pickle juice around anymore, just because it's been linked with that really negative experience in your mind. Wow, that is so wild. So you're saying our brains are constantly updating what things mean to us just based on these relationships, like as we're forming them, it's like, are our own emotional dictionaries being rewritten all the time? Yeah, pretty much. And this isn't just about like, you know, songs and pickle juice or whatever. Think about advertising. Companies do this all the time. They pair products with things that give you positive emotions, like good imagery or whatever, because they're hoping to kind of transform how people feel about their brand. That makes so much sense. It's all about creating those subconscious connections without us even realizing it. This is way more powerful than I thought it was. It really is. And it shows how important it is to really understand all these different types of these non-equivalence relations. These aren't just like theoretical concepts. These are actually at play in our lives all the time. Okay, so let's bring this down to earth a bit. What are some other examples of these non-equivalence relations? Like, 
in the real world? Well, I mean, even simple distinctions that we make all the time, like the difference between something being more or less, those are all built on non-equivalence relations. Like, think about how little kids learn about these concepts. They often use those different colored tokens, right? Where maybe blue means few and green means many, something like that. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. I've seen those used in early education. It's almost like a visual code for them to learn about quantities. Exactly. And just by learning to tell the difference between those different tokens, they start to grasp the idea of more and less, even before they actually understand, you know, numbers and all that. So it's like they're building a foundation for all these mathematical concepts, but they're doing it through non-equivalence relations first. Right. And those foundations extend to other areas, too, like spatial and temporal relations. Those are crucial for just like navigating the world around us, you know, like knowing your left from your right or mm -hmm. understanding the difference between before and after. Exactly. I mean, those seem really basic, but they're actually the foundation for so much. Like even just following instructions or learning about more complex subjects like history or geography. I mean, imagine trying to read a map if you didn't have a good grasp of spatial relations. It would be impossible. We would be totally lost. For sure. And then there are causal relations, which are all about cause and effect. And those are essential for understanding, you know, how the world actually works. Could you give me a real world example of that one? Causal relations? Okay, so let's say you're learning about the brain and you find out that damage to a specific part of your brain, the frontal lobe, that can actually lead to people being more impulsive in how they behave. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But it's not just about memorizing that fact. It's about understanding the causal relationship there. So let's say later on you meet someone and they're acting kind of impulsively. Yeah. Because you have that knowledge, you might wonder if maybe there's something going on with, you know, their frontal lobe. It lets us connect the dots in a deeper way. Oh, wow. So it's almost like these non-equivalence relations, they give us like this deeper understanding. Like we go beyond just knowing facts, but we actually start to grasp how all those different facts connect uh -huh. and why they even matter. But there's something that still kind of feels like a mystery to me here. What's that? Well, we've talked about all these different types of relations, but there's got to be something that like ties them all together. Mm. It's like we're missing a piece of the puzzle. Like, what makes our brain use one type of relation versus another one at any given moment? That is such a good observation. And that actually leads us to one of the most interesting parts of non-equivalence relations, this idea of context. Context. OK, so tell me more about how context comes into play here. So think of it like this. Context is kind of like the conductor of an orchestra. OK, it's not changing the instruments themselves but it's guiding how all those instruments play together to create totally different melodies. Okay, okay. I think I see where you're going with this. So how does that apply to, like, our brains and non-equivalence relations? How does our brain know which melody to play? Okay, so remember that example earlier about the coins, the quarter, the dime, and the nickel. Let's say you're in one context and you're asked which coin is less. You might say, okay, well, the dime is less than the quarter, right? but then change the context. Let's say now you're being asked which coin is more. Suddenly the dime is more than the nickel. The coins themselves are exactly the same, but the context totally changes how those coins relate to each other. And what if the context is just, you know, money? Then they're all basically the same because they belong to that category, right? Exactly. Context acts like this cue that's constantly signaling which type of relation is the relevant one in that moment. And it's what lets us be so flexible in our thinking because we can relate things in all these different ways depending on the situation. Oh my gosh, this is blowing my mind. It's like our brains have this hidden code and the context is the key to being able to understand it. But how do we even learn this code in the first place? Is it all just trial and error? It almost feels like we're just born with this like innate ability to connect all these different dots. But how does that actually happen? Well, that's where this theory called relational frame theory or RFT comes in. Basically, it's trying to explain how and why our brains are able to develop these really complex webs of relationships. OK, so give me the rundown on RFT. What's the main idea here? So one of the most mind blowing things about RFT is that it says that relating two things is actually a type of verbal behavior. Yeah, it's really deeply tied to our language skills, even when we're not actually saying anything out loud. You mean even when we're doing things that don't really seem verbal, like if we're sorting objects or trying to understand a map, there's like an internal dialogue going on in our heads and that's using language to make sense of those relationships. That's exactly it. And that kind of leads into this other really important idea, which is that through experiencing things, we start to develop what RFT calls 
generalized relational repertoires. It's almost like when we're learning how to imitate something, but instead of actually copying like physical actions, we're actually copying relationships, those abstract connections. Okay, I think I get that. <laughs> so like just from going through life, seeing different things, how they relate to each other, we build these mental frameworks that help us understand all kinds of relationships. And those just get more and more advanced as we go. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. We become really good at seeing analogies and then we can apply those patterns to totally new situations and information. And that explains why we're able to learn new things so well. Yeah. We're not memorizing these isolated bits of information. Our brains are actually building these like really dynamic networks of understanding. But earlier you are saying that this ability, this thing that makes us really good at relating things, it's not just about like intelligence. It can actually be tied to our sense of well-being too, right? Yeah. How does that work? Well, it all comes down to how these relationships we're forming. They can really shape our thoughts, our feelings, ultimately our behavior. Like, let's yeah. take knowledge as an example. We think of knowledge as this kind of abstract thing, but in a way, it's just this huge collection of related things, these stimuli. So the more we know, it's like the more connections we have on that map in our brain, and that just makes it easier to learn even more things. Yeah, exactly. It's like having all these different hooks that you can hang new information on. And a really key part of that is how we organize all that knowledge, those hierarchical relationships that we talked about before. Like how, to use that example from before, beer might fit into a category of drinks which is then part of this bigger category of beverages and so on. Exactly. And these hierarchies, they're not just for like, you know, academic stuff. They actually help us understand ourselves too. think about our self concept, how we see ourselves in the world. RFT says that our sense of self is actually built on understanding relationships like uh, me versus you here versus there, even now versus then. So we're constantly comparing ourselves to other people, our own experiences, even our past and future selves, all to make sense of who we are. Yeah, pretty much. And being able to see things from someone else's perspective, that's a really important part of that, too. It's like we can step outside of our own mental maps and then look through someone else's eyes. This is all so fascinating. But can you bring us back to that point about well-being? How do these two things connect? Right. So as incredible as our brains are, as good as we are at making these connections, sometimes those connections can actually lead us in the wrong direction. Think about those times where you get stuck in these loops of negative thoughts or you feel like you can't break out of an unhelpful habit. Tell me about it. I've totally been there. It's like you can't escape those thoughts. They just keep swirling around. And a lot of times those patterns are happening because of these really rigid or inflexible relationships that we've formed in our minds. RFT actually calls this psychological inflexibility. Like, for example, we might go through something negative. Maybe we fail a test and then we come up with this rule for ourselves. Like, I'm just bad at math. Ugh, I know that feeling all too well. Even if that's not really true, even if we're not actually bad at math, that thought can start to control our behavior. We might avoid taking math classes. We might not even try a math problem. And then those actions just make us even more convinced that we're bad at math. It's like this self-fulfilling prophecy, but it's all driven by our own brains. Mm. Okay, so how do we actually break free from these unhelpful patterns, these rules we get stuck in? That's where therapies like acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT can really help. ACT draws on this whole understanding of relational frames, and it uses that to help people become more psychologically flexible. Okay, so instead of trying to, like, fight those negative thoughts or run away from tough situations, ACT says we should acknowledge them, accept them, and then just focus on doing things that line up with our values, even if those actions are uncomfortable or they challenge those old rules we've been telling ourselves. That's a great way to summarize it. It's not about trying to get rid of difficult thoughts or feelings. It's more about learning how to relate to them differently so that they don't have so much power. It's about realizing that our thoughts, they're just thoughts. They're not always true. And then we can start choosing our actions based on what's really important to us. This entire deep dive has been amazing. We've covered so much ground from beer to the foundations of knowledge to self-concept, even our well-being, it's all connected. It really goes to show just how powerful these relational minds of ours truly are. Absolutely. This is definitely one of those deep dives that I'm going to be thinking about for a while. It's incredible how something so fundamental like how our brains connect the dots, it can have such a huge impact on our lives. Yeah. Everything from what we know to how we see ourselves, even our own happiness. I want you to think about this too. As you're going about your day, pay attention to how you're connecting things in your mind. 
Are those connections helping you or are they holding you back? And is there anything you can do differently now that you know about all of this to be more adaptable, more resilient, and just live a more fulfilling life? Think about that. Until next time, keep on learning.